Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's a huge, uh, huge pleasure to be able to um, share some ideas with you all. I've ne never been to this conference before, and I'm uh, very uh, gonna gonna really enjoy um, saying some things that are actually uh, fairly, um, uh, no, let's say, not as, uh, as as radical as some other things that uh, probably people have said. So that that's a new experience for me. And so, uh, if anybody's interested in the kinds of things I do, you can find all of that here. Um, I want to uh, say right up front uh, to set expectations. I don't particularly work on consciousness per se. Um, I work on cognition, agency, intelligence, things like that. And I do think they have implications. And so I will uh, kind of uh, go out on the ledge here today. But um, I'm going to make a fairly modest claim. I'm, I'm not going to try to produce a new theory of consciousness. I'm not going to try to uh, support one specific theory of consciousness with data. Here's, here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to make a, f a fairly, fairly simple argument that if we use composition and behavior as evidence of consciousness in other systems w when addressing the problem of other minds, that is, if our criteria include things like what, what, what are you made of, what are your behavioral competencies, and so on, if that's how we address it, then for the exact same reasons that we tend to associate consciousness with complex brains, we need to take very seriously the possibility of consciousness in many body structures. Um, that, that's, a, that's a very controversial claim in some audiences. Maybe it won't be uh, particularly controversial here. But what I'd really like to do is to widen the set of systems about which we think when we think about consciousness and, and related issues beyond human brains. You know, when we talk about AI, I, I don't want to think specifically about just is it human-like because um, it's actually much more, much more interesting than that. So, um, you know, w w one, of the, one of the key things is that I think we have to move beyond these kind of conventional intelligences. There's a f famous painting of Adam naming the animals in the Garden of Eden. And uh, if you think that there are these very sort of discrete natural kinds, then one can, can have these binary categories of which things do and do not uh, have consciousness. P people are pretty sure about Adam, not so sure about some of the stuff that's not shown here, paramecia, um, uh, slime molds, they all var various other things. So the reason that we have to think about these things is that uh, the standard human, which features prominently in, in philosophical accounts of consciousness and so on, is really just one point on, on two uh, uh, continua, um, or, or four, depending on how you want to count. But, but this, this, this kind of um, conscious or agential glow is, uh, you, you have to sort of decide what happens to it as you walk backwards from a modern adult human all the way back to the oocyte that all of us once were. Um, you can also walk it back on an evolutionary time scale and ask what happens all the way back, because all of these things are smooth and continuous. And in fact, with, with modern bioengineering and synthetic biology, it's now very clear that both using biological means and sort of hybrid technological means, we can create hybrids and chimeras uh, uh, in, in every possible way and really extend the typical embodiment in very diverse directions. And so we'll, we'll get back to this uh, more towards the, the end of the talk. And so what I've been working on is a framework, which I call TAME, or uh, stands for Technological Approach for Mind Everywhere. And the idea is to be able to recognize, create, and ethically relate to truly diverse intelligences. So regardless of composition, meaning what you're made of, or origin story, meaning whether you were um, produced the natural way or engineered or some combination thereof. And I want to be able to handle all of these kinds of things. Um, the familiar creatures, all kinds of weird colonial and synthetic organisms, uh, AIs, whether software or hardware, and potentially exobiological agents. And so, of course, people have tried before for these kind of, so this is um, a Rosenbluth et al. From, from the 1940s, trying for a scale of, uh, of, of these kinds of things that, that are not particularly bound to embodiments, let's say brains and things like that, very kind of cybernetic definition. And, and I've been working on a model that has to do with what I call a cognitive light cone, which is this idea that, that all agents have one thing in common, no matter what they're made of or how they got here, which is uh, the, the, uh, the ability to pursue certain goals in certain spaces. And the size of those goals, the, the literal spatiotemporal size of the largest goal that an agent can pursue, is one way that we can classify and compare very diverse intelligences. And the, the critical thing is that, as, as I'm f primarily a developmental biologist, and the, the thing that uh, always uh, just astounds me is that all of us were once what people call, quote unquote, just physics. We were all a quiescent oocyte, a little blob of chemicals. 
and slowly, gradually, without any uh, magical lightning flash that comes in at any particular point during development, we become one of these things, or perhaps even something like this that can reason back and, and make comments about not being a, a, a machine or being more than physics and something like that. So this, 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 this process is very slow and gradual, and what we're interested in is uh, that, that, that process and the scaling of competencies of very simple uh, minimal matter, chemical signals, systems, and cells and tissues, the scaling up of the tiny little goals of single cells, so metabolic and, um, uh, and transcriptional goals and things like this, into collective systems that have very large goals, I'll talk about this momentarily, and the, um, uh, the kinds of uh, uh, failure modes that the system has, which is a breakdown of that collectivity into cancer, back down to cells that have little tiny goals about proliferation and migration, and that's it, and they no longer care about the rest of the system. So, so, so the meat of our research program has to do with understanding the scaling, understanding that cognitive light cone and how it actually scales up from that of a, of a single cell and in fact below that in some other work that we've done with Chris Fields and Carl, Carl Tristan, um, and up, up, and up. And uh, one of the things that happens in development, which is, which is kind of interesting, is uh, the, the autopoiesis or self-construction of a single individual from a kind of um, a pool of potentiality, and, and it looks like this. This is an early blastoderm, let's say, of a human or a chicken or, or, or many other animals. We see, let's say, 50,000 cells, and we say, there's an embryo. What are we counting when we say that's one embryo? I mean, there really isn't one of anything physical. There are many, many cells. What, what is there one of? And this is going to become an individual. Well, what there's one of is alignment, both physical alignment and um, uh, kind of uh, 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 functional alignment towards a particular goal. That alignment is the creation of uh, a particular target morphology, a particular anatomical structure. As I'll show you momentarily, if you try to deviate it, it will find new ways to get there. So it's uh, definitely this kind of um, uh, homeostatic system. But uh, it, there doesn't have to be just one. And if you make temporary uh, scratches in this blastoderm, what you end up with, each, each of these regions not being able to feel the other self-organizes into an embryo. And eventually you end up with, with uh, twins, triplets, and, and many other selves. So the question of how many individuals are in an embryo is actually not clear. It's not set up by the genetics. It's a physiological self-organizational process. And what it means is that each one of these individuals has to, uh, on the fly, every single time that they arise in this physical world, they have to solve this important problem. Where do I end and where does the environment uh, begin? Every cell is some other cell's environment. How do these cells know what, uh, what they belong to? And so, uh, uh, as, as I think Turing actually recognized, this, this question of uh, how bodies self-organize is, is probably fundamentally the same as the question of how minds self-organize. And we see these kinds of dynamics in split-brain patients and dissociative disorders and so on. This question of how many individuals are present within a particular um, uh, amount of medium that, that underlies it. And so, and so then, you know, people, people who think about these things often think, well, okay, we have these uh, what we call collective intelligence is colonies of ants and termites and, and, and so on. But at least, we, you know, we, we are a true unified intelligence, right? We, we, we sort of, many people think that there's a fundamental difference between these, these cases. But of course, uh, and, and, and for example, um, Descartes really liked the pineal gland because it's, it's an unpaired structure and he felt that was uh, suitab suitable to the unified human experience. But if he had had access to good microscopy, he would have noticed that there isn't one of anything here either. This is what the pineal gland tissues look like. Inside of each one of these cells, you get all of this stuff. So there's, there's an incredible uh, multi-scale organization. And so the fact of the matter is, I think, that we are all collective intelligences. We are made of this kind of agential material. So this is a lacrimaria. It's a single cell. It has... Um, uh, it has no brain, it has no nervous system, it's very good at taking care of local goals in terms of uh, its anatomical structure, in terms of me metabolism, and, and so on. And uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, machines and living organisms and, uh, and, and, and consciousness, we have to remember that w uh, whatever theories we make have to make a ruling on things like this. Uh, what, what happens here? I mean, certainly people have a very um, uh, chemistry-based uh, views of these things, that this is what we are actually made of. And we may not feel like a collective of competent, tiny little selves that are managing uh, perception action loops towards emergent goals and weird problem spaces. But, but that, that, in fact, I think that is, that is exactly what it feels like to be that kind of a system. So, so I think we, we do, in fact, feel like exactly that.
And so the, the research program that we and others are, um, are embarked upon is to discover the scaling rules. How do we go from the individual competencies of our components to rotating those, those goals and competencies into novel spaces? And so uh, in bodies, not, not just human, but, but all bodies, biology uh, uses this kind of multi-scale competency architecture, this idea that uh, we are not only nested dolls structurally, you know, cells, molecular networks made of uh, making up cells and, and tissues and organs and so on, but actually each one of these layers has its own uh, problem solving capacity. They are all solving problems in different spaces, uh, morph um, anatomical morphospace, the space of gene expression, the space of physiological states, and of course familiar old three-dimensional behavioral space. And so that, um, I, I really like William James's definition uh, of, of intelligence, which is the ability to reach the same end by different means using some degree of sophistication. So um, I, I, it's, it's, it's very good because it's, again, substrate um, uh, invariant. It uh, really talks about uh, the idea of uh, a spectrum of competencies, and, and it's kind of agnostic about what space we're working in. That becomes important because, for example, in conversations about AIs and, and other things, when we say they're not embodied, I think we really need to expand our understanding of, of what spaces we could be embodied in. And so... Uh, we uh, and, and many other animals are pretty good at recognizing uh, intelligence in familiar three-dimensional space, so, so good old behavior. And this, this uh, medium-sized objects moving at medium speeds in three-dimensional space, we're kind of uh, familiar with, with birds and primates and other things doing that. But, there are, but, but biology does the same thing in other spaces. So there are transcriptional spaces where cells are able to solve very interesting problems. Uh, same thing with physiological space. I don't have time today, but I could give you some, some amazing examples of cells uh, exerting um, a novel problem-solving behaviors by navigating these spaces. What I will focus on for a few minutes is this, anatomical morphospace. So this is basically the space of all possible configurations of a group of cells. So, so they are, um, uh, Darcy uh, Thompson in the 40s was I think the first to really um, uh, get an idea of this, of this idea of, of embryos and other morphogenetic systems uh, navigating that, uh, that morphospace. And I think we really have to get into the idea that, that beings can be embodied and can have consciousness in these other spaces. I think that while we're very good at this, if you could imagine, if you had an innate uh, immediate sense of your blood chemistry, let's say, I think you would have no problem recognizing that you live in a higher dimensional space and that your liver, your kidneys, and other organs are in fact problem-solving intelligent agents that are, that are uh, navigating that space exactly the way you navigate three-dimensional space. So let's focus on morphospace and, and talk for a few minutes about what the competencies are of this, uh, of, of this. What I'm gonna, what, what, what we argue is that actually morphogenesis is the behavior of a collective intelligence. It's the collective intelligence of cells trying to uh, achieve a particular um, anatomical structure. One thing we know is that uh, development is incredibly um, robust and reliable, but it is not hardwired. So if I cut an early embryo in half, uh, I don't get two half bodies, I get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. And so there's this, there's this notion of, of different starting states being able to lead to the same goal state, this ensemble in morphospace that we, we, we equate to a normal uh, target morphology, and they can avoid certain local, uh, local minima. Uh, here's an example that, um, that we discovered some years ago. This is a tadpole, here are the eyes, the nostrils, the brain. And tadpoles need to become frogs. And in order to become frogs, they have to rearrange their face. So, so, so all the eyes, the nostrils, everything has to, has to move around. And so it was thought that this was a hardwired process, that every organ just moves in the right direction, the right amount. What we decided to test, the, to test that and, and to see how much intelligence actually is, is there. And so we created what we call Picasso tadpoles. Everything is scrambled. The eyes on the back of the head, the jaws are off to the side. Everything is kind of mixed around. And what we found is that these tadpoles become largely normal frogs because, in fact, genetics does not specify hardwired rearrangements. What it gives you is a problem-solving machine where every organ now moves in novel, unexpected paths to get to where it's going. Sometimes it actually overshoots and has to come back, but it'll stop when it's done. Okay, So, so what, it, what you really have here is a machine that can do a kind of error minimization scheme and start off in different configurations but always get to that same place in, in, in morphospace. And this is what, of course, what happens in regeneration. This guy is an, is an axolotl. They regenerate their legs, their eyes, their jaws, and so on. And you can amputate the limb anywhere, and uh, these, these cells will build exactly what's, what's needed until they get to the, um, a correct salamander limb, and then they stop. 
This, of course, is the most uh, kind of uh, the most amazing thing about this this process is that it stops. When does it stop? When a correct limb has been formed. Individual cells don't know anything about what a limb is or how many fingers you're supposed to have, but the collective absolutely does, and it can stop when you get there, no matter where you started. It goes beyond this this process of problem solving goes beyond damage to um, uh, an existing structure to what what I think of as a good example of really basal. Uh, creative problem solving, and it looks like this. This is a cross section of a kidney tubule um, uh, in a in a newt, and so usually about eight to ten cells work together uh, to to create these little tubules. Um, but if you artificially make the cells very large, so this is different than damage. This is not something that normally happens in evolution. You know, so newts lose their arms all the time. But this is quite different. This is, you, we, we've artificially made these cells to be gigantic. And so what happens is then fewer of them get together and they make the exact same size lumen. And the most remarkable thing is that you can make these cells truly enormous. And, and the way you do this, by the way, is you make them polyploid. So they have multiple copies of their, uh, of their genetic material. And so the cells get bigger and bigger. And in that case, one single cell will wrap around itself and give you the whole lumen. What's amazing about this example is, is a couple of things. Number one, um, okay, you know, scaling of, of number to size, you can sort of wrap your head around that. But what's happening here is a completely different molecular mechanism. Instead of cell to cell communication, you're now using cytoskeletal bending. So this is a good example of, uh, of, of top down causation where in the service of a particular anatomical goal, different molecular mechanisms will get called up to uh, to solve the problem uh, to give you the same outcome. And the second cool thing about this is that this is really an example of unreliable hardware. As, a, as an embryo, you can't count on how many copies of your genetic material you have. You can't count on how, what the size of your cells are going to be. You have to figure out how to get the job done despite massive amounts of novelty, injuries, uncertainty in your own parts and in the environment. So, so this is, you know, very basal kind of um, uh, pro collective problem solving. And how, how does all this happen? You know, how, how can they do this? And so uh, amazingly, um, or, or maybe looking backwards, not so amazingly, it happens using the same mechanisms that the nervous system uses to, to, to perform these functions. So I don't have to tell anybody here what the hardware and software looks like, but this idea of uh, ion channels setting up uh, various states that then uh, drive the physiology that is thought to underlie uh, various aspects of cognition and, and consciousness. And uh, neuroscience has this project of neural decoding where we're going to try to read all of these things and infer what the, what the creature is, is thinking, remembering, experiencing, and so on. So um, the, the, uh, the kind of uh, salient effect here is that this, this system did not arise when brains and neurons came on the scene. This is evolutionarily ancient. And even back at the time of bacterial biofilms, uh, through the work of uh, Goral Sowell, we now know that even back then, already evolution was using uh, electrically based computations to coordinate across space and time and to drive specific goal states from collective systems. And so what we've done is, is uh, uh, now develop some of the first tools that are able to read and write this kind of electrical information out of non-neural tissues. So we want to do exactly what neuroscientists try to do in the brain, but we look at other um, unconventional intelligences solving problems in anatomical morphous space. And so this is a voltage map of a uh, time lapse of a um, frog embryo um, organizing its uh, pr primary axes. And, and we can literally, using these voltage sensitive dyes, we can see, interpret, and modify all of the uh, integrated uh, information and all the communication that goes on to enable them to get to reach collective goals. And so it's a very parallel system, very much the way that the uh, uh, bioelectrical events in the brain are controlling muscles to move you through three-dimensional space. This more ancient system is using bioelectrical events elsewhere in the body, right from, from the moment of fertilization, to control all of the cells to move the configuration of the body through morphous space. It's the same thing. And what we think evolution does is basically pivot the same set of tricks across various spaces. And so what we can do is we can, of course, we can image this. And so this is, again, voltage sensitive fluorescent dyes. This is a video of a, a, a frog embryo putting its face together. And this is one frame. And long before the genes and the um, uh, uh, anatomical uh, uh, rearrangements of the cells uh, begin to form the, the frog face, you can already read out this pre-pattern. Here's you, in, in fact, and I'm showing you this one because it's the easiest one to decode. We have others that are, that are a real bear to make sense of. 
But this one is pretty obvious. Here's the animal's right eye, here's the mouth, here are the placodes. You can already read the, uh, the pattern memory in this tissue that is going to guide the collective activity of the cells to be able to reach that normal frog target morphology. Um, and so this is the normal pattern. This pattern is required for development. If I, if I perturb this memory, you get, uh, I'll show you in a minute uh, what, you, what you get. The, this is a pathological example. So these are, uh, this is a human oncogene that's going to basically cause the cells um, ultimately to uh, electrically disconnect from their neighbors, roll back to a unicellular lifestyle, and their cognitive glycone shrinks from that of, of a large organ down to individual cells. And now, as far as they're concerned, the rest of the body is just external environment. They're no longer part of this collective, and that's um, uh, tumor genesis and metastasis. And you can detect this quite readily, this, this shift. You can, you can actually see it happening now. So the way we manipulate these things, um, we don't use any kind of... Um, uh, electrodes or applied uh, um, magnetic fields or anything like that. We use the native interface that the cells are normally using to control each other's behavior and link up into this larger scale intelligence that's able to move in morphous space and, 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 and other spaces like that. So what that means is we can, we can target um, these gap junctions, these electrical synapses. We can uh, control uh, uh, the voltage states directly using optogenetics, using drugs that open and close these, these channels. Uh, we can control the neurotransmitter movement through these networks. All the same familiar tools of neuroscience uh, do, really do not distinguish between neural tissue and other tissues. Everything works. The tools work. The concepts work. Everything is, is readily portable, and so that's what we do. So I want to show you an example, and this is just one of, of many examples of what happens I showed you that electric face picture, and one of the things there was an eye spot. It was a particular pattern of voltage um, that corresponds to an eye. And we said, what happens if we recreate that same pattern memory somewhere else in the body? And so what we did was we injected ion channel RNA, encoding a potassium channel that sets that particular voltage state. We encoded it. We, we stuck it in some cells that are normally going to be gut here. So this is endoderm. And uh, when you do that, those cells are happily enough make an eye. And this eye has all the right um, lens and retina and optic nerve and all of that stuff. Many things we could say about that. Um, one of the most uh, interesting things about it is that uh, very much like the kind of uh, scaling that you see in other collective intelligences, it has the following property. This is, this is a lens sitting out in the tail of a tadpole somewhere. The blue cells are the ones that we actually injected. But there's not enough of them to make a proper eye. And they know this. And what they've done is they've recruited a bunch of their neighbors, these un unmarked, because they were not directly modified by us, cells to participate in this eye building project. So what's happening here is these are all in native competencies of the tissue. We didn't have to do size control. We didn't have to tell them how to build an eye, what all the different uh, gene expressions and cell types. We didn't have to do any of that. We put in a very simple uh, prompt or stimulus, uh, build an eye here. And uh, all the stuff that's downstream of that, you know, including the way ants uh, recruit their, their neighbors when they have a task that's too big for them, all of that, all of that works. And so, so we're starting to see these, uh, some of these properties and how to, how to interface with them in the body. And one of the most uh, important things is the ability to literally rewrite these pattern memories. So this is a planarian, these flatworms. Um, the most amazing thing about them is that you can cut them into pieces. And if I cut off the head and the tail, this middle fragment 100% of the time regenerates into a nice one-headed worm. So you can ask the question, how does it know how many heads it's supposed to have? And if you actually look at the bioelectrical pattern, you see this interesting pattern that says one head, one tail. And what we can do now is we can rewrite that pattern. This is kind of messy. The technology is still being worked on. But you can see what we've done is we've said two heads. And if you cut this animal, now you get a two-headed worm. And this is not Photoshop. These are real, these are real animals. Now, notice something very interesting. Uh, this bioelectrical map that is, is the map of this perfectly normally, uh, uh, normal anatomical structure, one-headed creature. The gene expression is in the right place. The anatomy is in the right place. What we've changed is the internal representation of what a correct planarian looks like. And they stay normal until you injure them. If you injure them, then, they, then all the cells consult this pattern and they end up building this different pattern. So that, that question that I asked at the very beginning, how do the regenerating cells know what to make? They literally store a memory of where in morphospace they're supposed to go. That memory is rewritable and you can, you can think of this as a very primitive precursor to our um, amazing um, uh, time travel, ki mental time travel capacities, be, um, being able to imagine things that haven't happened yet and remember things that are not happening now, because 
this bioelectrical pattern is not a map of this two-headed creature. This is a map of this perfectly normal one-headed animal. So a single planarian body is able to store at least two different representations of what a correct planarian is supposed to look like. And I'm sure there's, there's lots more, but, but this is the one we've, we've nailed down. So, so it's a, it's a very uh, primitive uh, example of a counterfactual memory. What would I build if I were to be cut at a future time? Not what's going on right now. What's going on right now is this, one head, one tail. Now, I keep calling it a memory. Why is that? Because it has all the properties of memory. So if I take these two-headed animals, which, by the way, are genetically perfectly normal. So uh, the question of what sets the number of heads in a planarium is not uh, very simple. It's not that the answer is not genetics. Because if I take this two-headed animal with a perfectly wild-type uh, genome, I can cut him again and again, and in perpetuity, uh, he will continue to regenerate as two-headed forms until we set him back. We know how to rewrite it back to the, to the one-headed state. And so this question of how many heads are supposed to uh, be formed, that memory of where do you go in morphospace space to the one-headed region or the two-headed region, is stored physiologically, not genetically. It is long-term stable. It is rewritable. I, I showed you uh, the latency a minute ago, um, conditional recall, and it has discrete behaviors. And here you can see what these um, two-headed guys do uh, in terms of uh, when, they're, when they're hanging out. So not only can we control head shape this way by putting these uh, false, li literally false memories into this collective agent, we can actually um, think about um, as well, uh, we can actually think about head shape. So whereas normally the species would make a triangular head shape, if we perturb the network topology uh, while it's regenerating, just for 48 hours, they will sometimes, they can, they can make these normal heads, but they can also make round heads like, a, like an S. mediterranea or flat heads like a P. felina. These are other species of planaria. They are, again, genetically uh, 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 untouched, but, but there's about 100 million years of genetic uh, distance between these, these animals. And so um, this, of course, includes the shape of the brain, the distribution of stem cells. They become just like these other animals. And so the same exact hardware can be, uh, can be pushed to visit other uh, regions of that morphospace. This is very much like uh, behavior in three-dimensional space. The hardware can learn many different things. They do, it doesn't always do the same, the same thing. And of course, you can get them to hallucinate um, kinds of um, uh, morphologies that, that are not even uh, uh, typical for any species of planaria, such as these spiky forms, cylindrical forms, and sort of combinations. So the exact same hardware can be pushed into, into lots of different, um, lots of different uh, domains. And so for the last couple of minutes, I just want to show you one thing. Uh, we, we, we were just talking about this, this, this anatomical morphous space and the different shapes that are, that are there and the uh, species that naturally know how to get to particular, particular regions and then how you push other, other uh, types of um, uh, uh, implementations into those regions. But what, what, does the, what does the space of possibilities look like for totally new beings? So let's, let's make something that um, has not existed on Earth before and see what happens. So, so this, is, this is a project that um, we did with uh, Josh Bongard's lab at the University of Vermont, and Doug Blackiston did all the, all the biology that I'm showing you here. So this is an early frog embryo. Uh, at this stage, we take the, anti, we, uh, the animal cap ectoderm. This is skin. These, all of these cells are going to become skin. We um, dissociate them. Here, uh, we dissociate them, uh, cut, cut them away from the embryo, dissociate them, and, and, and put them on their own. They could do many things. They could die, they could spread out, they could form a two-dimensional monolayer, they could do nothing. Instead, what they do is uh, they, uh, they gather together, and um, over, over the next 24 hours, they're going to uh, come together, and they're going to make this, this little interesting thing, which we call a xenobot. Xenobot because Xenopus lavis is the name of the frog, and it's a biorobotics platform. So the interesting thing is that the frog genome certainly knows how to make this. This is what we typically see, and this is what we typically think the frog genome encodes, a set of developmental uh, stages and then some behaviors. But they can also encode this. This is a xenobot, and it has its own interesting developmental sequence. Um, it's never been seen before, and it has interesting behaviors. What are the behaviors? Well, the first thing they, these things do is they repurpose their little cilia, the, the, the little hairs that normally redistribute mucus down the body of the frog, and they start to swim. And they can go in circles. They can go back and forth like this. Uh, they have collective behaviors. They have individual behaviors. Here's one navigating a maze. So you can see here, remember, there's no, there's no nervous system. This is just skin. They, 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 it goes, it takes the corner without having to bump into the opposite wall. And then here, for no reason that we understand yet, it has the spontaneous uh, change, of, uh, change of heart, and it 
turns around and goes back where it comes from. So these are uh, spontaneously motile organisms that have different um, uh, behaviors. Here's one amazing behavior. If you provide them with loose skin cells, they will uh, run around and uh, collect those skin cells into little piles. They will compact them like this. And because they're dealing with an agential material that is not passive particles but cells, these little, uh, these little piles mature into xenobots themselves, and that's the next generation. And guess what they do? They go on and they do the exact same thing, producing the next generation and the next. This is called kinematic self-replication. No other animal on Earth, to our knowledge, does this. Uh, this is completely novel with this uh, with this kind of uh, this 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 kind of construction, and so um, they don't have neurons, but they do have a lot of calcium spiking. Uh, and you can imagine doing all of the things that neuroscientists do with um, looking for um, uh, transfer entropy and mutual information, all these kinds of things. Uh, the, 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 so we can ask, what do the cells say to each other? What do two uh, xenobots say to each other? We don't know their co uh, cognitive capacities. Um, we're investigating that now. What can they learn? What are their preferences? Really important that we can't make armchair claims about this. This has to be empirical studies. So I'm just going to end here with, um, with two slides to say that uh, because... Uh, biology has to solve all these problems every time that a being arises into this world. It has to set its boundaries, figure out what the effectors are, what the sensors are, it, and nothing can really be assumed. Uh, it's so interoperable that pretty much any combination of evolved material at any scale, designed material, and uh, software is some kind of agent. And people are already making cyborgs and hybrids and, and every possible combination. Which, which has implications. We, we are going to be living in the next few decades in a, in a huge um, uh, option space of, of new bodies and new minds. You know, Darwin said endless forms is most beautiful about the natural forms. They're a tiny corner of this space. Uh, we're going to have to come up with ways to relate to beings that are um, nowhere on our tree of life. So these old criteria of what do you look like and how did you get here are not going to be useful anymore. And all of these binary categories are going to uh, uh, wash away as well because and when people make claims about machines and robots and organisms, uh, it's just very difficult to support any kind of clean, um, clean separation. So I'm going to stop here um, and just uh, uh, summarize what, what I've tried to say, is that uh, biological systems solve uh, and, and operate in all kinds of spaces. Um, they have behavioral competencies that include memory and learning and problem solving, navigation, representation, uh, perceptible uh, by stability, active inference, and so on. The underlying mechanisms are also the same. They use ion channels, electrical synapses, neurotransmitters, microtubules, electric fields. All of that is present in all of the structures of, of, of bodies. And if these are the kinds of things that we think are associated with consciousness, we have to take very seriously uh, the possibility that there are other unconventional consciousnesses in our bodies and increasingly being made by bioengineering kinds of um, uh, uh, efforts. And, uh, uh, you know, to, to me, just, just taking a step back of how, how we think about these things, all agency claims are really protocol claims for how you can re optimally relate to that system. And so as an engineer, you know, I, I want to guess correctly for various systems as where I am on this, on this spectrum. But of course, it's not just about engineering. It's also about relationships. And uh, you, people are trying to develop sort of proof of humanity certificates and so on. And the question then becomes, what do you really want when you have proof of humanity? Are you looking for proof of, of native DNA? Are you looking for proof of native anatomical structure or something that we explore here, which is really a, a kind of competency for compassion that, that may, maybe that's the more important thing. And this is an example, um, Mid Journey is an AI system that I asked to, uh, to draw its, uh, its vision of uh, two uh, synthetic organisms in love. And this is, uh, this is, this is what it drew. So um, uh, if anybody's interested, uh, especially these two papers are relevant, but there's a, there's a whole bunch of work on this. And uh, I want to thank uh, all the people who, uh, who did the work that I showed you today and all our, uh, all our many collaborators, uh, of course, and our funders. And I thank you for listening.